Ah, wait a minute. Yeah, we wanted this. Oh, yeah, say it over. Oh, oh. Um, uh, 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 Sebenarnya, 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 s
Okay, very good. Then uh, the four o'clock class has joined at the 11 a.m. Oh, so this is our last time to get. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> good. Okay. I think next time we have four classes. <laughs> yeah. Two is good. Four is solid. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Good. Okay. Okay. Uh, that's right. It's better. Yeah. Mm. Great. Excellent. Okay. 35 to 40 minutes. So 35 minutes would take us to... 1440. So let's let's shoot for that and I'll probably go further. Okay. Okay. Uh Trima Kasipak. Uh, shalom. <laughs> um yeah, I'm glad to be here with you today. I apologize. I usually like to stand up when I talk, but we're on Zoom, so I'll have to sit for the presentation. Yeah. Okay, and uh, uh, so is this also a, 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 just a different section of the philosophy class? Okay, very good. Yeah, so it's a, it's a pleasure to be speaking with the philosophy class today. Yeah, my, um, my uh, doctoral dissertation was in uh, philosophy. But actually, it's right on the on the question of how philosophy and theology relate to one another. Yeah, most uh, specifically, how Philip Melanchthon, Martin Luther's closest co-worker, uh, integrated philosophy and theology. Okay, but our topic for today is a Lutheran view of justification and atonement. Oh. Oh, my um, screen is not advancing. Oh, I'm not, it's not responsive. 
Let's try this. Maybe if I let's try to stop share. Okay, let's try again. Great. Share screen. Okay. I, I wonder what's going on. Yeah, still not uh, still not advancing, Puck. I don't know what's going on. Well, let's do it this way. Maybe. Uh, sorry for every sorry to uh, delay a little bit. There we go. Maybe we have to do it this way. Let's try. So, okay. Uh, screen share. Okay, let's see if we can uh, get it this way. Maybe we'll have to do it this way. So apologies for that. Um, uh, for some reason, let's try one more time. I just hate to. I think it would work much better. So let's let's try one more time to see if we can get it to. Oh wait, here we go. We'll, we'll move this down here. Maybe that's the problem. Okay, let's see if we can. Okay. Oh, there we go. Okay, we got it going. Okay, so uh, the the topic is uh, a Lutheran view of justification, and of course, uh, Lutheranism is uh, a way of being Christian, and that way of being Christian is based on uh, the uh, Augsburg Confession. For those of you who uh, don't remember, right, the Augsburg Confession was written in 1530. Right, by Martin Luther's closest co-worker, I just mentioned him, Philip Melanchthon. And to this day, all the different Lutheran churches in the world Um, more or less agree that what makes us Lutheran is that we teach what the Augsburg Confession teaches. Or rather, probably a better way of putting it would be that we agree that what the Augsburg Confession, te that the Augsburg Confession faithfully uh, represents what the Bible teaches. Okay, and here we have uh, the first eight uh, articles or topics of the Augsburg Confession uh, uh, in very brief form. So uh, uh, let's read through them together. They very quickly and, and kind of thoroughly lay out the basics of Christian faith according to Lutherans. <laughs> The Satu Tuhan, Papa Anak, then Ro Kudus, Alamen Chit, Menompang, then Magnesi, he Samoa, Kita Adala Orang Bardosa, Rusak, Kita Tidak, the Pat Memparchaya Tuhan, then in second of Hati, Pikiran, Jiwa, then Ro Kita, Kita Hanya Men Punyai Kekwatan Untuk Menalak Tuhan. Alabapa mengutus Jesus sang putra untuk menyelamatkan kita. Alam mengasihi kita ketika kita masih berdosa. Kita dipermaikan dengan Allah oleh kasih karunia saja, melalui iman saja di dalam Kristus saja. Iman bukanlah peperatan kita, hanya roh kutus yang bekerja iman kepada kita. Kita tidak terselamatkan melalui perbuatan baik kita. Roh Kudus memberi kita iman dan menggerakkan kita untuk <coughs> kasih karunia dan iman melalui khotbah dan sakramen-sakramen. Gereja adalah perkumpul untuk mendengar Injil dan menerima sakramen-sakramen. 
Okay, so um, we will uh, back, we'll kind of revisit uh, most of these points uh, in, in in the half hour that follows here. But I'll just point out that for Lutherans, it's this uh, number four, it's article number four. Right, that stands right at the center of Christian faith. Right, so that uh, Luther said, this is the article on which the church stands or falls. Or we could say this is the article on which, according to Luther, Christian faith stands or falls. So that to be a Christian, according to Luther, just is that you agree that we're justified by God, by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Okay, so we'll look we'll look much more closely at this, and actually on several of uh, much of what we just read as we go through this uh, treatment of justification. Yeah. Now uh, let's start just with the term justification, right? Uh, we're we're concerned with how we uh, become justified before God. That is, we're concerned with how we are put back into a right relationship with God. Okay. Um, so supposedly there was, a, there was a famous philosopher named Voltaire, a philosopher of the French Enlightenment. And uh, when he, he he was somebody he didn't really believe in he he had he uh, he believed that there was a God but he didn't think it mattered that there was a God. Right? Somebody well as as he was dying, somebody asked him, uh, "Have you have you uh, reconciled yourself to God?" Yeah, and uh, and he said, "Oh, I didn't know that we were quarreling." Yeah, but uh, Christian Church teaches that yeah, we have this problem with God, right? That we're we're not um, automatically in a right relationship with God. So that if we want to talk about being justified, we have to talk about. What makes us unjustified? Right. If we want to talk about uh, getting right with God, we have to talk about, well, how is it that we are not in a right relationship with God? Okay. And the first several articles of the Augsburg Confession that you just read, um, talk about that. They, they discuss that. Yeah. Okay, so here's what those articles teach in a kind of a visual, a pictorial form, right? I always find it helpful to think in pictures. I tend to think in pictures more than in words sometimes, yeah. Right. When you think about uh, our relationship with God, your own relationship with God, the church's relationship with God, it's good to get that relationship in its proper context. And according to Scripture, the context in which we should think about uh, any relationship with God is that it starts this way as pictured over here. 
right? Uh, whenever you think about your relationship with God or you go to God in, in worship or in prayer or, or in, you know, in praise. Uh, according to scripture, it's it could be helpful to think about this, right? That that God comes first. That is to say, before we ever do anything to connect with God, before we ever go to prayer, we worship, we read the Bible, before we do any of that. <laughs> God has already acted for us and and with us. That is to say, we, we don't approach God as equals because God's the one who created us. Right. Uh, uh, God came long before us, right? But uh, infinitely long before us, yeah. Yeah. So uh, really, um, uh, we can only really respond to God, right? Right, because God's always uh, come to us, acted upon us, or acted for us first. Well, here's the basic good news that the Holy Scriptures start with, and that is that God's first action toward us is love. Right. Uh, why did why do we even exist? Right. Uh, scripture teaches, well, it's this loving, creative act of God that is responsible for you being here and for me being here. So every one of us exists because of God's love. Right, everything that's ever existed, all of creation exists because of the loving action of God. You can imagine the holy, well, maybe you can't imagine, but we try to imagine the holy trinity existing before anything was created. And as scriptures uh, tell us about creation, we can imagine God saying, well, uh, I, want some, I want something to love other than myself. So God said, let there be light. And you know what comes after that. Everything else is created by the word of God. Okay, so that's the context in which our our stories always start. And as Christians, you know, we've come, we, we're we're born into existence in these last days, as the uh, uh, Book of Hebrews puts it. Right, God. In these last days, God has spoken to us by God's Son. Right, so in the image, we've got you know God coming to us in love, and and the cross is in the middle of the heart to uh, symbolize the love of God in Christ, which which is uh, God's uh, ultimate and and uh, final, definitive statement of God's love for us. Okay, so the first part of this story about justification then is that God created us in love, and at, from the very beginning, God loved us. And what's more, Jesus Christ proves once and for all that God has always loved us. Right. And and the life and death and resurrection of Christ proves once and for all that there is nothing we can do to keep God from loving us. Right. Remember here, uh, 
Christ is being crucified and as they're nailing him to the cross, he says, Father, forgive them. Right? If there's anything that could cause Jesus to not love you, it would be nailing you, that you're nailing him to the cross. And yet he said to the he said of the people that nailed him to the cross, Father, forgive them. Right. Or maybe the very worst thing that you could do to Jesus would be that maybe imagine that he called you to be one of his closest friends. And in the very hour of his greatest need, you abandoned him. Yeah. Well, that's what all the disciples did, right? And yet when Jesus rose from the dead on the third day and he appeared to his disciples, he said to them, what? You abandoned me, so now I reject you. Yeah. Well, as, as the scripture says in Greek, meganoito, never, never, yeah. Right, he appeared to his disciples and he said, peace be with you. He said it twice. Then he said, receive the Holy Spirit, right? This greatest gift that anybody could receive. Right, as the Father has sent me, so I send you. Okay, so uh, this is this is uh, the beginning of our of our story about justification, right? That that God loved us, created us, Jesus loved us, died for us, and there's nothing that we can do that can make Jesus and God the Father not love us. Right. So uh, when we talk about uh, about justification, right, it presumes that we need to be justified, that we're not in a righteous relationship with God. But if we're not in a good and loving relationship with God right now, it can't be then because somehow God has rejected us. God, or that God has decided not to love us, or that somehow we have to persuade God to accept us, right? Jesus proves once and for all that that uh, God uh, wants to give us eternal and full life, that Jesus is able to give us full and eternal life, and that Jesus means to give us full and eternal life, Right. Okay. So, um, so, uh, well, when Jesus, uh, when Jesus comes to us in love, right? Uh, Jesus says, "Look, uh, I love you just as you are, no matter who you are, no matter who you aren't." Right. I accept you, and I love you, no matter what you've done, and no matter what you failed to do. And my great desire for you is that you uh, live the best and fullest life beginning right now. Right. And, you know, a life that will find its fulfillment in its perfection in eternity. Okay, well, we might, you know, we might say, hey, look, this is all good news, right? It's fantastic that God loves us no matter what. Yeah. 
And it's fantastic. It's, it's what a blessing that Jesus wants us to have not only a life in eternally with him, but to have the fullest and best life right here and right now as well. All right, so, so fantastic. But then the question is, well, what, what does that life look like? What's that all about? And Jesus says, it's really quite simple. First, just receive my love, right? Receive the word of my love and, and, and receive the Holy Spirit through the church. And then, just as I've loved you with everything that I have, you just love me back with everything you have. With all your heart and mind and soul and spirit. And love your neighbor as yourself. Okay. And the very natural human response is, as we see in the lower, <laughs> the lower, uh, yeah, yeah. Well, oh, wait a minute, God, that's that's too much. I mean, not that I, not that I don't love you at all. I mean, sure, I'll say prayers to you, and I'll go to church on Sunday, and I'll put money in the plate, and I'll serve on committees. I'll even go to seminary and become a pastor. <laughs> but love you with all of my heart and mind and soul and spirit. Yeah, I'm not going to do that. Yeah. I got my own plans. I have my own ideas about what I want to do with this life. And I know what's good for me better than you do, God. Right, and so the next little picture, right? So we we run from God, right? We say, okay, yeah. Now the word in Scripture for uh, our our uh, unwillingness to trust God, our un inability to love God back, is sin. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so um, you know. And uh, just a word about the consequences of sin. I'll just say that, you know, this whole picture of sin here, right? That's Article 2 of the Augsburg Confession. And, and it's worth pointing out that, well, what's, what's the problem? Why don't we, why don't, why doesn't God just let us go and do our own thing? <laughs> Well, and the answer is that, look, God is the source of all life and joy and peace. And when we when we reject God, we separate ourselves at least somewhat from the source of all life and joy and peace. Yeah, separate yourself from the source of uh, of life and joy. And it's it's just impossible. It's logically impossible for for us to be satisfied if we're separated from the source of joy and peace. Right? The dissatisfaction leads to frustration. Right? Anger. And ultimately, we separate ourselves from the source of life, and we must die. Okay, so uh, all of this uh, to a uh, point. What's why do we need to be justified? Why do we need to put into be put into a right relationship with God? Because we're sinners. Right? We we don't and can't trust God. Okay, so uh, that's Articles 1 and Article 2 of the Augsburg Confession. Article 3 uh, says, well, Jesus came to put us back in a re right relationship with God.
Uh -huh. Right. And in the terms of the solas that we say, we could say Christ alone justifies us. Right. So I'll just point out that Augsburg Confession, Article 4, um, kind of explains this a little bit more fully. You'll you'll get this uh, PowerPoint presentation in your WhatsApp, and you'll be able to read this uh, in Bahasa, like so. But um, but yeah, basically, um, Article 4 of the Augsburg Confession just says we're put right with God. We're justified by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Yeah, so, um, you know, uh, the question, though, that comes, I, I think the, the biggest work is actually to figure out why do we need to be justified? But the, the next question is, how does Christ justify us? Yeah, so um, I'll, I'll just point out that there are um, that there are two wrong answers to that question. How does Christ justify us, or how does faith justify us? Or at least, let's put it this way: the Lutheran tradition says that, according to Scripture, there are two uh, ways that we might try to be justified that uh, that can't work. Yeah, so we might say there are these two ways of trying to justify ourselves that are really easy to believe, but they don't work. And then there's the way that Christ actually justifies us that's hard to believe. So, in brief, it's very natural that humans would think that we can justify ourselves before God or that we have to justify ourselves before God by our works. And also, it's very natural for us to think that, well, yeah, if we do enough good works or the right kind of good works, well, that will that will cause God to stop being angry with us, and God will accept us then if we do enough nice things for God. Right. But... Based on what we already saw, we can say uh, this, this can't be, the, these ideas can't be correct. Because again, they both presume that the reason that we're in a bad relationship with God is because it's God's fault. God's mad at us. But in fact, we, based on scripture, we know that it's not, it's not God that's rejected us. We're the, God's always ready to accept us. It's we who continue to not trust God. And so if we're going to be put into a right relationship with God, um, it's it, we it, we don't need to worry about changing God's attitude toward us. Right. The problem is us. Right. Our sin. Our unwillingness to trust God. Our unwillingness to love God the way that we need to love God if we're going to uh, have full and eternal life. Okay, well, let's let's take a look at each one of those uh, uh, possibilities in turn, starting with the idea that we maybe we can justify ourselves by works. <laughs> Right. Um, we we uh, pretty much all Protestants agree that we're justified by grace alone. Right. 
Right. And yet we also kind of want to say, well, maybe we're, it must be the case that we're justified by grace and good works. But I just want to suggest to you the idea that we're in any way justified by our works contradicts the idea that we're justified by grace. Right, you know, Paul talks about this in Romans. He says, hey, look, um, grace means that you get uh, some kind of favor, something good that you don't deserve. Right. If you work for your boss all week and at the end of the week he gives you a paycheck, um, that's not grace. You earned that money. Right. If you owe your landlady, uh, you know, uh, uh, a month's rent and you can't pay it and she says, you know what, um, you don't have to pay rent this month. That's grace. You didn't earn that benefit. She just gave it to you for whatever reason. OK. How many of you have uh, landladies that uh, have have said, you know, don't worry about paying rent. That's okay. I'll, I'll just let you stay here by grace. Yeah, probably nobody, right? Because you wouldn't be able to afford to be a landlady if you did that very often. Right. Although we might suggest that your parents have done that for you for 18 or 20 years, right? Yeah, so it, it's really natural for us to think, well, if we're going to get something good from God, we have to earn it. But uh, always keep in mind that when we say that, you know, we have to somehow earn it, that's absolutely contrary to the idea of grace. Right. Grace is when we receive something good that we absolutely don't deserve. Right. In just a few minutes, we'll, we'll kind of uh, uh, state this a different way. We'll say, well, grace is uh, is when you receive something good unfairly. Okay, so um, the Augsburg Confession, uh, Article 6, um, is dedicated to saying, you know, salvation doesn't come by good works. Right. But it also says, but, but don't think that, don't think that there's no relationship between salvation and good works. That would be wrong, too. It's it's just that uh, salvation doesn't come by way of by means of good works. Rather, what when we have this 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 uh, faith in God, um, when we, and, and we know our salvation, we can't help it. We 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 feel like we have to. We we really want to do good works. Right. My favorite uh, scripture verse uh, that kind of points this all out is Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. And I'll, I'll just read it. For grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. Uh, uh, it is the gift of God, not the result of works. Yeah. So uh, 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 not not the result of work so that no one can boast. Yeah. 
right? For Luther, the most important, the, the same idea is stated uh, most importantly in the third chapter of Romans. Okay, so let's uh, just uh, skip over that and say, so, you know, uh, from a Lutheran perspective, right, we are not, uh, Lutherans teach that St. Paul teaches <laughs> that uh, we're not justified by our works. We're justified by grace through faith apart from works of the law. Okay, and uh, so um, uh, then uh, the other uh, kind of mistaken idea from a Lutheran perspective of how we're reconciled to God, how we're justified, is this idea of uh, penal substitutionary atonement. Yeah, let me just uh, mention, uh, we'll go back a little bit here, that, you know, uh, John Calvin promoted this, another fellow named Anselm of Canterbury promoted this. And uh, and here's here's how uh, this uh, idea um, goes, and probably it's an idea that you've heard. You know, a lot of uh, so-called evangelical Christians promote this idea. In fact, some say you have to believe this in order to be Christian. Whereas Lutherans say, well, if you believe this penal substitutionary atonement, you don't believe what the Bible teaches about justification. So here's the basic idea. Starts with the idea that God is almighty and all just and rules all. And that when and that sin is an offense against God's justice. We break the law. We break God's command. Well, God is all just, right? And and lawbreakers have to pay the penalty for breaking the law. And so according to this view, God can't simply just be gracious to sinners. God has to, God's justice has to be satisfied. Right, when you break the law, somebody has to pay the penalty. Somebody has to suffer the consequences of breaking the law. Well, what's the consequence of breaking God's law? Right, according to this theory, the proper punishment for breaking the law or dishonoring God is death. Well, that puts us in an especially bad spot, yeah? <laughs> Because that means that in order to satisfy God's justice, we have to let God kill us. But then if, but then if, we, were to, if we were to give ourselves over to God to kill us, we would be dead. We wouldn't be able to live justified lives, yeah. <laughs> So, according to this theory, well, here's what here's what uh, uh, what happens is Jesus comes and he pays the penalty for our sin. Right. He he suffers the consequences of our sin. And so if we just trust in Christ, then uh, we uh, we can be innocent and we can have eternal life. Jesus. 
Yeah, here, hold on. Okay, so um, here's here are the problems that Lutherans have with this substitution theory. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I bet it's a theory that you've all heard pastors preach on in different churches. Or on, on the radio and so forth, yeah. So, yeah, the problem is this theory uh, acts as if uh, God is not perfectly free. It, 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 it talks about God as if God is subject to a power greater than God. Because it says, well, God's not free. You know, when when, when uh, sinners approach God, uh, according to this theory, God's not free to just forgive them, to be gracious to them. Right? God's required to do what justice demands. Right? Remember before I said that uh, uh, grace is actually contrary to justice. Yeah, I, I think this is historically, I believe, a real, uh, the fundamental difference between Lutheran, Luther and Calvin's theology, Luther's and Calvin's. Yeah, that Calvin uh, insisted that God was fundamentally and above all just. And Luther insisted that God is ultimately and fundamentally gracious. Yeah, so according to Calvin, and uh, as Lutherans read Calvin, you know, God's justice prevents God from being truly gracious. And according to Lutherans, God in God's graciousness has determined not to treat us as justice requires. Okay, Lutherans claim to have a really strong scriptural support for our account. So uh, I wonder if somebody would read for us uh, Colossians chapter 1, verses 20 through 24. So uh, again, these verses, you know, in addition to what we're just reading about, God being gracious, right? Grace, grace, grace. You know, um, uh, this uh, this uh, passage is also really important for Luther's way of thinking. Cautions one twenty twenty four. Dari 
dalam Yeah. Okay. So, um, you know, Paul writes, you know, to the to the Christians in Colossae, you were once estranged and hostile in mind you know, to God, right? Right. And in the verse previous to that, um, Paul says that in Christ, God is trying to reconcile to himself all things. That is, it's all people who need to be reconciled to God, not God who needs to be reconciled to all people. In other words, it's all people who are estranged and hostile towards God, not that God is estranged and hostile towards all people. Yeah. I'll just point out, Paul you know, uses this language of God reconciling uh, all things to himself. He uses that again in, in uh, Corinthians. It's an important idea for Paul. Okay, so um, so uh, we aren't justified by good works. We aren't just we aren't put back in a right relationship with God by somehow convincing God to accept us. Yeah, I'm all, already way over time, but I'll, I'll just quickly um, read. Um, I'll read this uh, uh, kind of a Lutheran account of how this uh, justification works, and then I'll illustrate it quickly. Yeah, so uh, according to a Lutheran take, right, the scriptures teach that when we sin, we separate ourselves from God and God's kingdom, and we claim ultimate control over our lives. But when we separate ourselves from God, as we said before, we make ourselves subject to death and hell and misery. And that sinfulness, in our, in our sinfulness, we're not just able to decide to love God. Right? Sin is that there's something about us that refuses to love and trust God. So what's the price that needs to be paid in order to persuade us to love and trust God? Well, God sent Christ to us to pay that price to us. To show us that God already loves us so much that there is nothing that God would withhold from us. Not even his own son. And, and even when we do the worst to God's son, God will not reject us.
right? That is, uh, uh, in Christ, God is trying to, if you like, pay us off or persuade us to trust God. Okay, so I'll uh, I'll illustrate now. Okay, we'll see how this goes. It worked pretty well before, so we'll we'll do it this way. Okay, so I need a one uh, a chair, if you would. Thank you very much. Oh yeah, we need it over here. Yeah. So okay, so uh, let's say <laughs> the 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 better chair is God. Okay, and then this is us, right? So so um. Picture, picture this, if you would, as a, a, a kind of an image of uh, humanity uh, in our original state. Yeah, think about Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Right before they sinned against God, yeah. Well, they saw God, Scripture says, face to face. They looked to God face to face. They had this very close relationship. Nothing separated them. And what happened? Well, Adam and Eve said, you know, this is nice, but we're going to eat that fruit of the knowledge of good and evil and be in control of our own lives. Right, so this is our unjust relationship with God. Okay, now, according to Calvin and according to the penal substitutionary theory, well, God has to do what's fair in this situation. And it's only fair if we turn away from God that God turns away from us. Okay, so if this were correct, it's not correct according to Lutherans, but if this were correct, what will we have to do to be put back in a right relationship with God? Well, first, we'd have to repent, turn to God. And then we'd have to try to persuade God for, to turn around and face us again. Both of those, uh, what I claim are mistaken ideas about justification, claim that one way or another, we try to persuade God to turn around and, and be nice to us again. Okay, well, according to Lutherans, the main problem with this view is that Scripture teaches exactly the opposite. So let's return to that point where we have this unjust relationship with God. Right. According to Paul, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. So we, we can think about it this way. Because God sees that we're turned away from God and that we're not going to turn back to God, in Christ, God comes to live among us, to, to, to reestablish this relationship with sinful human beings. Yeah, and so uh, that's how Christ justifies us, right? In, in Christ, God comes to sinful human beings who are not inclined to repent, who are incapable of repenting, and God turns to them. Okay, so uh, again, there's we've left out huge parts of the story here. You know, the role of the Holy Spirit is absolutely essential in this.
but for now, I think this is uh, this is a good image to keep with us. Yeah. Okay, and and I, I think that gives a, a a good kind of pictorial understanding of a Lutheran account of how Christ justifies us. <laughs> So let's let that be enough for now, and let's continue with questions, yeah? So thank you very much for your patience, yeah. Yeah, terima kasih untuk uh, um, pertanyaan bagus. Yeah, um, so and in fact, this is exactly uh, so. The Augsburg Confession kind of follows up with explanations about both of the things you ask about. Yeah, so um, let's start with uh, the role of. Well, let's start with the role of the Holy Spirit. and the relationship between the Holy Spirit and freedom. I'll just kind of going back to our uh, illustration here. Um, we got the two chairs. Yeah. So um, the, the, the Lutheran claim is that uh, human beings by our own power, right? We're not able to avoid sinning. That is, we're not able to have faith by our own reason, will, and understanding. Right. So uh, think about it this way. Here we have, you know, God and humanity reconciled through Christ. Right. And God put us in this relationship by sending Christ to us, yeah? We didn't do anything, right? We just received God's graciousness. Yeah. So we could say that kind of using this image, right? Faith would be something like faith is just kind of continuing 
to, in this relationship with God. And the Holy Spirit gives us the power to do that, gives us the freedom. Right. Now, um, if the Holy Spirit, so again, but because, you know, uh, it, when we're in this previous, you know, situation where, where God's over here, right, we, we somehow don't have the freedom to turn around and love God on our own. But in this situation where God has come to us in Christ Jesus, well, we're made free. That is, uh, whereas before, while we're sinners, we're not free to love God, so we're we're bound to sin. In this situation, when Christ has come to us, we're kind of back in the situation that Adam and Eve were in originally. Right? That is, it's possible for them to not sin. It's possible for them to continue to trust in God. Right. We say that that's possible because, you know, God's sharing the Holy Spirit with us when God communicates with us. Through the word, we receive the Holy Spirit. Yeah. So when we have faith, we're not really doing anything active. We're just receiving God's grace and we're receiving the Holy Spirit and we're letting God's grace and Holy Spirit keep us in faith. Yeah, Luther said that we receive faith or that we come to faith passively. Now, to be sure, right, we, we live out the faith, right, very actively, right? Our, our power and strength come in how we share God's love given to us freely in Christ. But with respect to having faith, right, we either receive it as a gift But God doesn't force us to receive it as a gift. Right? I mean, we, we are always free to turn back around. In fact, as St. Paul says, it seems like we're, we're inevitable. It's inevitable that, uh, you know, at, at some point uh, we will reject God's love, right? We sin, we sin every day, right? If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth isn't in us. So here's our freedom. We, we have this choice. We can receive the grace of God passively and have faith. Or we can do the one thing that's available to us to do on our own, and that is to reject God. Okay, well, why, why would God let us do that? Why doesn't God just build us so that, yeah, we, we, we never choose to sin? Why doesn't God just control our spirits completely with, with no freedom on our part? And to that, now uh, uh, I'm, I'm speaking as a Lutheran, but not, I don't think Luther actually said this. Um, but um, it seems that God wants nothing so much in all of the universe as much as God wants us to love God back. Uh, yeah, God God can do just about anything. Uh, 
But um, God can't force us to love God. And the reason isn't that God's, you know, God's all powerful, right? But but it just it's it's a contradiction in terms to say that that God would force us to love God. Because the very notion of love entails a freedom that, that only a free individual can choose to love another. Right. That's how it is in our human relationships. Right. I mean, I mean, we 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 have to open ourselves up to love another. And here's the, the mystery and the very scary thing about, about faith is that it seems that God so desires us to love God that God was willing to create us with the power to reject God's love. <laughs> Because we have to have that power in order to choose to love God. Yeah. Right. But with that choice also comes the possibility that we might forever reject God. And to forever reject God is to face eternal death and misery and destruction. Yeah, uh, that's what Paul means when he talks about the wrath of God, right? Like in the first chapter of Romans, Paul says, uh, you know, God shows his wrath by when humans were being really sinful, God said, well, if you want to live this sinful life, Go ahead, see what happens. You know, we say in English, you know, fool around and find out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But anyway, yeah. So that's that's the, you know where the spirit comes in and and this whole idea about about freedom. Yeah, it's 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 really one of the great mysteries and really terrifying thing about faith, right? That God has allowed us the freedom to reject God forever. Yeah, all in order that we would be able to love God. Yeah, so Jim Cassie is good. Very good.
Yeah, could you uh, repeat the question again one more time? So it's uh, the uh, confused about the relationship between grace and freedom. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Yeah, and maybe maybe just to kind of clarify um, uh, the sort of who is who is free and how are we free? So, um, on a, on a Lutheran reading of the scriptures, right? Um, human beings, by our own nature, right? We're not we're not able to love God on our own. That is, we're not free to choose to love God until God has given us the Holy Spirit and God has given us faith. So, you know, Lutherans would, it might be correct from a Lutheran perspective to say, we don't have free will either to choose God or to reject God. But when God fills us with the Holy Spirit and gives us faith, we have freed will. That is, we have will that has been freed. Yeah. And, um, you know, uh, I guess we could ask the question, wouldn't it have been more gracious of God to um, to have made us in such a way that we automatically had faith? I heard somebody once say that. Well, it looks like that's one of the characteristics of the angels in heaven, right? Is that they don't they don't actually uh, have the freedom to they don't really have the freedom to reject God, right? Right. They they just uh, they just kind of love God automatically, right? And this is maybe the most, uh, this kind of points to the most audacious claim that the scriptures make. Uh, and, and it makes me uh, blush and it makes me nervous to say this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But that other than God, after God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, There is no higher, more exalted being in all creation than the human being. Right. 
scripture says for for uh, for to what uh, angel has God ever said sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool yeah yeah but but um you know God did not become an angel in Christ Jesus God became a human God, God took on humanity in Christ Jesus so uh you know God has gifted us with God's given us this greatest gift that made us the most after after God's own being we are the most exalted beings in creation right higher than the angels who automatically love God yeah in some ways less powerful than the angels yeah but in some in really important way more exalted than the angels and uh, so uh yeah so uh, in some way that seems like that's um well, that's that's just a, an almost incomprehensible gift yeah You know, that God is through the Holy Spirit, God graces us with this freedom that the angels don't have. Right. And with that freedom, the possibility of of uh, uh, of uh, offering God what God desires the most in all of creation. Right. which is to love God back from, from our freedom. Yeah. 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 So uh, I suppose the, the, you know, according to the Bible, right. That's a, that's a, that's more gracious of God than it would have been to make us unable to choose. Right. Certainly, it's it's more risky, right? Certainly, it's it's more uh, uh, of, in some ways, more frightening. Yeah. Right. But at least from a Lutheran perspective, that seems to be the biblical claim, right? That we have this greatest, but be, be, because uh, you know that that God has graced us with this most great gift and then of course Christ Jesus above all but also the the uh, possibility of loving God freely by the power of the Holy Spirit yeah so I, ho I hope that's at least a good beginning of an answer to the question yeah The heart of God. God 
according to the so 33 verse 1 is God does not desire the death of sinners, but that they turn from their sin and live, right? And so where, so uh, do we have a, a, a kind of a verse to work off of uh, on the claim that the, 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 those who reject God will be, you know, uh, killed? So, yeah. So um, I guess all, I, all, uh, all I'll say about that is, that, you know, um, I think sometimes when we read about uh, you know, what the scripture says about, you know, the guilty dying and suffering and things like that. I, I think we don't uh, sometimes fully uh, apply this word about God not desiring the death of sinners. Yeah. So, for example, you know, um, I've always I remember when I was first a pastor, you know, people in my congregation wanted to do a Bible study on the book of Revelation. And a couple of the elders in the congregation said, you know, we just get so tired of hearing about God being loving and gracious. We want to read about God really beating up on people who who reject him and and you know sinners paying the 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 price for for rejecting god but i just remember as we were kind of reading through the book of revelation together as a bible study just how clear it was that in this vision that John has, God is doing absolutely everything that God, that one can imagine to um, provide opportunity for people to turn to God before being destroyed. Right. Yeah. So, so you know, a third of the. I'm. I'm sorry. I'm not a. I'm not a Revelation scholar. But you know, a third of the the rivers dry up, and and you know, a third of the earth is burned. Right. And again and again, you hear about the angels flying over, and as if in absolute astonishment, saying, you know, all this stuff is happening before the sinner's eyes. The earth is passing away, and it's going to pass away completely. And and. Uh, the angels flying above and just in absolute wonderment saying, and yet there was nobody who repented of their sin and turned back to God. Yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, I, again, we were reading that and, and uh, you know, it was kind of reading this from this perspective, this, this perspective I've been sharing with you and saying, well, look, if in the end God is all in all, then, then uh, hatred and selfishness and greed and anybody whose life is built upon those things can't survive. Yeah, and yet, I mean, here's that terrible wrath of God is that God doesn't force the sinner to, to reject these, these things, the sin that, that can't survive into the kingdom where the love of God and Christ is all in all. Yeah, I had a friend who was really unhealthy, 
And he went to the doctor and the doctor said, you know, if you don't give up smoking and drinking and, and really unhealthy diet, you're going to die in just a few years. Yeah. And my friend said to him, well, I'd rather die than go without smoking and drinking and eating the way that I'm eating right now. Yeah. I think that's in Revelation anyway, that, that you know, uh, thinking about those who absolutely reject God, that's kind of the, the choice that they wind up with. Look, you know, God's again and again saying, repent and turn to me. And again and again, people say, you know, I'd rather live a life based on my greed and my selfishness and my hatred for other people, uh, uh, power seeking. I'd rather live that life than live in God's kingdom of love. Right, and, and in the book of Revelation, you know, the, the, the sinner can see that this world that's built upon sin, right, selfishness and greed, it's not going to last. So your choice is between going with a world that's going to perish for sure or trusting in the love of God, you know, turning to this kingdom that's everlasting. And to God's great sorrow, it seems, there are plenty of people who say, you know, I'd rather die than live in this kingdom where God's love is all in all. Hmm. Ah, yeah. I'll see. Why did 
Tomorrow is the same thing? No. That's it? Justification? No. Okay. 